Welcome to the Pro Agent Podcast, where we're either interviewing top real estate agents nationwide or breaking down the industry's best business strategies. I'm your host, Chris Hardy Jr., real estate entrepreneur. Join us as we explore the mindset, skills, strategies, and execution it takes to perform at the highest level in the industry. So we're super excited today. We have the GT Luxury Group. Nick Tronny, Matt Gewurz out of New Jersey, and I have been hearing so many great things from uh, one of our friends, Mr. Chad Cooley and Michelle Wilson. Um, I follow these guys on Instagram. They're just taking listings. They're getting business like crazy, and they're doing so many things. They have to be doing so many things right, and they've given me the, they've given me the opportunity to you know, bring them on the podcast, ask them a lot of questions, and really get into what's making them as successful as they have become. And so thank you, too, for, uh, for being with me today, man. Uh, oh, good appreciate to be here, it, man. Good to be here. Yeah, so now, based on, I don't, not, I don't know these guys um, you know, on an individual basis. We're, we're kind of meeting, for the most part, for the first time. However, we're very much acquainted through co-founders, ProAgent, um, EXP, and I'm watching uh, all of Nick's reels. He's posting of him cold calling and all this kind of craziness, and then everything's cool he ta- that talks to you know, everything he's talking to me about. And so I feel like I know a, a decent bit, and we're going to learn a lot more today. I would like to start off with, from what I'm seeing so far, most agents are getting the business, they're individual agents, maybe they're going to go join a team, they're doing something. We'll, we'll get into what brought you both to this point, but did you guys know each other before real estate at all? Matt, you could go first. I grew up in the same town as Nick. I'm a bit older than he is, and in our town, there's kind of like a staple pizza place called Vinny's. It's been there for a long time, and that's just kind of where everybody in Wayne goes to. It's known as the best spot. Um, And I was just a regular there. And uh, one day I was picking up lunch during another busy day. Nick just asked me, hey, you do real estate, right? And I was like, yeah. And he um, took my number, hit me up the next day. He's like, hey, I'm actually interested in checking out real estate, seeing what it's all about. Uh, He started to shadow me for a little bit, uh, eventually got his license kind of dove right into it and uh, just like, man, this guy's an animal. You could see the potential and the work ethic in him. So uh, we joined forces and that's kind of what led us here. Almost like uh, the world worked itself out how it should, like an alignment. Dude, that is awesome because so many people, you know, I get people that, you know, I'm at the gym, I'm somewhere and they're like, hey man, you're in real estate. And you give them some information yeah. and you see what they do with it. And then they don't do shit, you know? And so <laughs> Nick, Nick must have been like, no, dude, I want to be doing this kind of stuff. And this guy seems like he knows what he's doing for the most part. Um, now, Nick, were you working at that place or something or no? So it's my family business. So like oh. my, my dad and mom moved here from Italy, like when they were tw- in their 20s. Uh, dad bought the pizzeria from his brother and, uh, you know, ended up. My mom ended up in there, long story short, and uh, I took it over with my brothers when I was 18, worked it for four years, um, and uh, I was getting my license to be an invest, like, as just as most agents, I honestly hear on podcasts where they want to be an investor, you know, they just want the inside of the real estate market, so they get their license, and then, you know, my mom overheard Matt talking one day, (laughs) like, uh, (laughs) over the counter, just saying, like, oh, he sold all these properties, and my mom just mentioned it to me so one day he came in and i like i said he said i asked him and uh we uh i ended up getting my license and meeting we met at the office and that was kind of it dude that's awesome you know that kind of reminds me of I, i'm going blank on his last name there's a guy in new jersey over there on like in jersey shore area his name is jeff he's with keller williams um and hmm. uh he was a teller at a bank and he kept on overhearing these agents um, like he was like an assistant or something, and he would hear the lady who was receiving the checks through the window talk about these agents are making these like big commission checks, and he's like he's like 18 years old. He's like, what's up with that? You know, what's that all about, right? And then he asked one of the agents, and then he ended up getting his license, and now that guy sells like 200 homes a year, right? So what yeah. a, what a great opportunity like that where your mom's like, hey, this guy's talking about some some checks getting cashed over here and some houses getting sold. So um, man, that's really big. And so I'm gl- I'm guessing that the family's pretty happy about. Uh, that occupation shift from, you know, from the shop to this. Yeah. Right? Um, it was, it was tough for them at first, you know, it's like, um, it's, it was a great dynamic, you know, and, uh, it was like a lot of things that I do in our current business is kind of what I did in that business. And, uh, 
you know, it's it's just not the easiest thing. You know, me and my brothers being partners and like uh, mm -hmm. it was a little scary for my mom. But uh, ultimately, you have to do what feels right, you know, and uh, I just know how much money I need to make. Like if Vinny's if the pizzeria went out of business, let's just say I know everybody's income. So mm -hmm. I just know how much I need to make to be all right. You know, man, that's smart. And you know, maybe you and I, you know, for Matt, did your parents like run a business growing up or were they, did they work for somebody? No, just kind of like typical corporate America, blue collar people. Yeah, so like you kind of saw that and you're like, I'm gonna go do my own thing. And then you, Nick, kind of come from this perspective of like, you know, my family, my people kind of run their own business. And so you, you have that benefit of kind of being raised with like this hard sweat equity and doing something for like this family vision. Um, I have some of that stuff in common. You know, my parents started a brokerage when I was in, in 1993 when I was four years old, right? And so, you know, when you, it, it is nice to be able to hop in and be a part of a family who's kind of running a business and then kudos for Matt to go, you know what, like, I'm not trying to get on that hamster wheel of corporate America um, because a lot of times those people can give their heart and soul to something, but they don't really get it back. Right. And so um, to not be in that position where you're just stuck at some income, especially in the U S right now, where the income, when you work for somebody is not increasing exponentially as much as inflation is. Right. And so uh, prices for a house go up 200,000. Well, you're not getting paid another hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. And so, you know, it, it really pays to get in the business. You know, we'll talk about a little bit more in here, but most people are getting into real estate and they're not really running a business accordingly uh, the way they need to. Right. And so for Matt, you got in the business before Nick, how, how long have you been in the business for? So this is, this is my ninth year in business. And um, I've seen like several shifts over the past couple of years specifically. So Nick is getting in at a very interesting time in real estate. Um, but, you know, I was always that solo agent, uh, started out not really doing too much business, kind of learning the ropes. By year two, started making a little bit money. Um, by year four or five, business really started to pick up. And, you know, things are good as a solo agent. But um, I think you have to be open to opportunities when they present themselves. And uh, I never kind of planned on finding a partner. It just kind of happened like that. Um, so it's, it's exciting to say the least. Yeah, no, and it makes sense because maybe if you had 100 opportunities, maybe it wouldn't work with 99 of those other people, right? And so the fact that you guys got set up with each other and the vision was strong, you know, you go, hey, we got to hold the vision and trust the process, right? Um, and we're going to get a little bit into like the journey. Uh, but for, for you, Nick, how many years in the business now? Is it two years, four years? What's it look like? Like November, a year and a half ago. You know? <laughs> so the good thing is you can go, hey, uh, Matt, um, I don't know Jack about this uh, thing. And so this just popped up today. You know, what do I do? Right. And so what a great. What, a, what a great source of some wisdom. And he's probably had to do a lot of trial and error on his own. Right. And so you get to benefit and get to move faster, uh, you know, because of that. Get, you know. You guys, you know, one at a time can give me an idea of this. You know, I wrote down this question. It's probably the fattest question I have on here. You know, what did that journey look like for both of you up to this point? And you kind of talked about that a little bit, Matt. Um, you know, in the sense of like, you know, brokerages, did you ever join some kind of a team? Um, now we know how you ended up working with each other. But, you know, like, were you going after the business a certain way, Matt, in the beginning that like, you know, it's different now. And now that you have Nick, like how, how have these things kind of changed and what's really like been the biggest changes, um, at least for you guys in the last maybe year and a half since you've been with each other? When you start out, you're kind of fresh into it and you kind of have to navigate your way. If you don't have proper guidance, it's very difficult. So growing up, one of my best friends, his father is a big time real estate agent. And when I got out of college, you know, stuck in a ton of student loan debt, um, average grades all throughout college, so what am I going to do to really, you know, not be stuck in this corporate ladder? And sales is the way to go. I thought of my friend's dad who made the most money out of anybody, um, told him I'm interested in doing real estate. He's like, absolutely. I'd love to like uh, have you shadow me on the road. Um, so kind of learn from an old school guy who kind of did things his way, very particularly, not really having any like proper uh, office guidance, just kind of learning through experience and for my first few years in business it's definitely just like it's a grind you know you're trying to get that business get your name out there and even up until just a couple of years ago it would just kind of be you know you're on this hamster wheel of forever chasing your next deal 
always looking for that next listing, trying your best to beat out these other agents, doing open houses constantly. And then Nick stepped into the picture and he kind of opened my eye to a whole new uh, way of doing real estate because it's so easy to get stuck on this hamster wheel and just kind of like get stuck in the grind and not really focus on the business rather than in the business. And Nick has uh, kind of guided me into implementing systems into the business to make it act an actual business, not just kind of uh, winging it how most agents do, as I did, because how would you know better unless you really are educated about it? So Nick opened my eyes to how valuable it is to have systems and, and have people who you can delegate certain tasks to that take away from money making activities, because ultimately it's best off that we are involved in the money making activities and not the admin work, the, uh, the things like sending out paperwork, things that are just not necessary. They, they take away from the time. So from going to solo agent to having a partner, it makes sense when the partnership uh, is aligned properly and one proper or uh, one partner brings something to the table that the other partner does not bring. You know, you complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. And that's kind of why we've been able to elevate our game and really implement new systems and bounce new ideas off of each other. So it's been really, really uh, cool to see. And it's just the beginning of a journey that, um, you know, we try to get better every day. You know, every morning we text each other, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., whenever we get up, let's go, all caps, yeah. get juiced. <laughs> we got to start the day off on a good note. Let's go, right? Just like, let's make it happen. Man, well, what I hear from exactly. that, what I hear from that too, man, is like, kudos for you, Matt, because in most positions that when we see an agent, right, like, in most cases, if Nick was going to an agent who's been in the business longer than they have or just in the business and they're not even in the business really yet, right? That other agent, yeah. even if even if that agent ain't shit, they have ego because I know things you don't know. I know the way this thing's supposed to be done. Do it the way that I'm telling you how to do it. But you you seem like you were like, I'm kind of in this typical real estate roller coaster, right? Where it's like, I'm trying to chase yeah. a deal. Man, two, three months go by and got no deals. And then I got one month where I closed three deals. I'm rich for a month. Uh, let's go to Cancun real quick. And then I have no money. And then, you know, this is a cycle that most agents are in. And you said a couple of things that were really solid, which is I wasn't really running a business. You were really just like trying to get lucky and do certain things the right way. Maybe you can give them, dude, there's agents out there that can give the greatest service of all time, but they can't find the business, right? They'll give them all the attention. They'll yeah. give them all the care, but getting the business and then for Nick to come in and be like, hey, like this is some things I'm looking into and you being open to that is great. And then what, Nick, what got you to go, hey, you know what? Like, there's some things that I'm seeing on how to really maybe be productive in this business that Matt could learn from that even gave you, because I, I think for a lot of people, they may not even have the ability to go, hey, man, there, these are some things that I'm looking at. We should look into this a little bit further versus just go, hey, let me let this guy just guide me, right? Like, what, what was going mm -hmm. on for you, Nick? So I'm going to just start off by saying, like, the one thing that I absolutely love about Matt and the reason why we're here today is because this man never shot an idea down. He never put his ego first. And he always told me, go for it and said, you need money. I got you, you know, like was straight up. Like when I tell you, and I'm just going to throw this out there now, like there's a reason why our partnership is very successful. And it, for me, I look at it as an edge because I know how difficult it could be to have a partnership coming from being partners with my siblings. Um, but, um, so going into that question, um, I've never shied away from that in my entire life. Uh, you know, I've always been able to just tell somebody straight up what I'm feeling and, you know, where me and Matt really complimented each other is like, when you say Matt going through that roller coaster, Matt wasn't doing that. Matt was doing 30 to 40 deals a year. You okay. Know? Like, okay. Matt, good. Matt was, Matt's a producer. He's a, he's a, he's a, cause he's a stone cold hustler, you know? And, um, but obviously me, my biggest gift that I'd say to this point is what you said is like, I look at how people do things and I, I see the mistakes they've made and I'm fast to try and model something that works because there's no point of me reinventing the wheel. So through like, um, through that whole experience of like, you know, when, when I was, I went to college for one semester 
and kind of just knew like I have to teach myself this thing anyway. And like yeah. while I was going to college, I was honestly trying to be like a day trader or something. You know, I was like going early, reading like stock books and stuff. And um, so I ended up dropping out of college just because I knew it wasn't for me. And like that was just something my mom was so upset about, but I didn't care anyway. And I, I got into the family business, which was dying. You know, like they were running into debt every single week. My mom had a partner that was robbing from her for 10 years straight, you know, and uh, it is what it is. But, um, you know, I learned business at a young age because I, when I dive into something, I dive in all in. Like, I, I'm not just like winging it. Like, I'm reading every book on pizzerias and restaurants and business, you know. And um, I quickly learned systems, you know, because in a pizzeria, you need to have equipment in certain orders, certain stations, the way you take orders, how to get efficient with phone people, how to be the most efficient way so you could deliver the food on time. You know, you can take orders at max capacity and you can handle it. And I understood at a young age, like starting to think long term, like, you know, where I'd rather make less money on one business, but have the systems to where I get my time back so that I can duplicate that process. And one thing with that business is there's four owners who are siblings, who are all adults, who work full time, who need to make money. So me being 18 years old, I could live off of peanuts when my mom's paying the bills of the house. So I can't pitch to them, guys, like we need to take a pay cut Let's for a short term, let's, let's open up other pizzerias and get this to stabilize itself. So ultimately, it got to the point where I felt like I was in a position where it was no progress. And that's like kills me. Like my greatest fear is being in the same position I am uh, 20 years from now. And then that's when I got into starting to think about real estate, started doing it part time, <laughs> working with Matt. And it's, and it's funny because like uh, from like literally week four, I was telling Matt, like, yo, like, cause it was the Matt Gavertz group. And I was like, yo, like, <laughs> it's going to be Gavertz Trani group. Just watch. He's like, yeah, we'll see. Just give it time. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, I instantly just do what I do. You know, I go on YouTube. I'm resourceful. Cause our brokerage didn't give us any, I, we didn't have no chat on Michelle. We just like go do what you got to do. And, um, I came across Brandon Mulrennan and then I came across Kevin Mills came across Abe Safa and came across Greg Harrelson. And then once I came across Greg Harrelson, I went in on him. But um, I, I really quick before I keep going on, you know, I could talk forever, but uh, I, <laughs> I, the one thing I lacked in this business, and I didn't realize this until I left the pizza business and put myself around people like Chad and Michelle, like yourself, like Brent Grove, like these type of people is I didn't understand, I didn't have the skill of real estate yet, but I knew business and business. You could apply to any business. Yep. Um, so I brought business to Matt and Matt brought real estate. So we were able to have so much success because as we were ramping up systems, I didn't have to go through eight years of experience. I just had Matt and Matt would go and, and crush it and dominate, get listing signs on the spot. And that's why we're able to run with it. But um, that's kind of why I just saw lack of systems and I just started implementing stuff. And as it worked, Matt started believing more and more. And that was it. Did you feel that like, so, cause it's great to hear that Matt was like close and he's doing like 30, 40 deals a year. So clearly things were moving well for you and you're in a good market. Price points probably pretty good. However, the fact that you could even do that kind of business but did you feel like you were kind of freestyling, Matt, a lot of what you were doing, but you were just you were just out, you were just hustling really hard. And then when he came in with like, 100%. yeah, and then he comes in with this different mindset for business because he has like this history of kind of being a part of family business. And then, man, I feel like if you could do what you were doing already and then it just makes this team undeniable. Right. It like it just connects it it's really what you said earlier, which is like you get this person who's really good at this and this person who's good at that. Most agents don't want to think like that because we'll talk about in a minute, like how you guys like what's the strategy in the sense of like how you actually operate. Most people can't release um, or relinquish that like uh, responsibility of like doing certain things, whether it's a ten dollar an hour task, whether it's going on the listing appointment, whether it's any of those types of things. But when you know when you actually when you you know hold the vision, trust the process and you really um, trust each other. Right. And you know that you're both um, hustlers. You're both giving it all that you have. 
um, things are going to work out. Now, it does not work out that way if one of you is giving 150% and the other person's giving 50%, right? Like, that's never, that's never really going to work out. So, like, 2023, you're in the business for, I guess, um, a full year, pretty much, Nick, by that time. Mm -hmm. This is, like, his uh -huh. eighth year. Is that correct? Somewhat. Yeah, November, some I got yeah. my license November 2022nd, and then January 1st, 2023 was kind of like, you know, I left pizza February of that year. So I got my license November. I left in February. Okay. Okay, cool. So we've kind of been full time since February of 2023. From so almost. So from February to now, how has the dynamic changed? Like, were you like, hey, we're going to prospect or I'm going to prospect and you're going to go on listing appointments or, or, or I'm going on my own appointments. You go on yours. Like, is it running the way it is right now based on how it started in February or what's changed? What did you guys learn? When you first start out in a partnership, there's still like a lot of learning to do about the other person. Um, so you come to certain situations where there's disagreements and, you know, you kind of reach forks in the road at certain points and it takes having tough conversations in order to overcome obstacles and get to where you need to be. You have to be very honest about your situation and be willing to be honest with the other person about your feelings. And uh, there's plenty of times where uh, our roles got mixed up and, uh, and we intertwined roles and there was just confusion um, and there was a uh, lack of communication in some departments. And it just takes confronting those issues, recognizing them, and then confronting them head on. That's the only way through it. And if you want to build a strong partnership, it's, uh, it's necessary to have those honest conversations and try to work out through issues. So throughout this process, we've just continued to strengthen our communication and you know, kind of come to an agreement on who plays what roles. And we kind of divide and conquer in that sense, we play to our strong points. And as we've uh, continued this partnership, we've also uh, integrated new systems, uh, new ways of doing things. You, you see what works and what doesn't work. And uh, you know, it's an ongoing process. And that's like the, the joy of entrepreneurship and real estate as a gen in general. It's something to get excited about every day when you get to build something from the ground up. And when you turn it into a business, there's always room for improvement. And it's so fun, like getting able to, uh, when I first started real estate, it was freestyling, just like you said, you know, it wasn't a business. Every day is kind of like a grind. And now it's building a business and it's something exciting to look forward to. And ultimately, you know, we have goals of bigger things other than this daily consistent grind that every realtor gets stuck in. So having that vision and these goals set you know, it's a, it's a fun process to go through and every day is a new learning experience. Even now in year nine, you learn something new almost on every deal. Yeah, for sure. And I love the candor because you have to have that like straight up relationship of saying, hey, you know what? This has to be different. This needs to go this way. And what I notice from a lot of teams, whether it's a team of two people, five people, 10 people um, or more, the issue is that when they lack communication, they talk less, like they're lacking the communication about the important things, so they talk less in general. And then when they do talk, it's more about like, it's, people are upset with each other, they don't understand their roles, they're expecting this person to do this, this person to do that, nobody's really doing anything, um, and it creates a lot of problems. And it's, it's, you know, being confrontational with each other creates a certain level of trust that most people don't have. Now, there's times where people may butt heads, but what happens after you butt heads? There's growth, right? And confrontation creates that growth, and people want to run away from that. And it's, it's really going to limit them in, in the future. And so if we were going to, in a you know, clean and precise way, say like, hey, this is what Nick does. Like, what's, you know, what's Nick's daily regimen and what's Matt's daily regimen? How are they the same or how are they totally different so that people can kind of see, like, how this really operates? Before I get into that, I want to tell you, though, like, me and Matt's edge is, is what you just said. It's, like, our relationship and ability to just be up front and communicate and our ability to be reasonable is is uh, one of our edges because... We've we've have butted heads, like you said. We've had times where we've almost even like went our own ways in the beginning. And it was just like, 
understanding, like having that confidence and belief now that no matter what comes up, we're both reasonable is like, just gives us utter confidence in each other. And, um, it, we've always been that way, but so in terms of the beginning of business, when we were first meshed together, kind of when I was like, kind of still mentoring a little bit before it became both of us, um, you know, Matt had his business and was doing his business and I was kind of just testing stuff. Like, you know, I was calling Fizbo's. My first listing was a Fizbo. I remember going on the Fizbo appointment, got it signed. I called Matt. He's like, he was like shocked. He's like, he's like, good for you, man. That's awesome. That works. But um, <laughs> He's like, right. You know, because sometimes, <laughs> hey, Matt, right. Like don't most agents just hate the idea of calling for sale by owners, right? They're like, dude, they hate us. Um, they feel this way. They're going to do it on their own. And then Nick's like, hey, I'm going to call for sale by owners. And then you get a damn listing for, for sale. By I love it. I love it. So yeah. I, I started, I started diving heavily into cold call. Like I loved it. Cause once, I, once they broke it down for me that it was like, you get this many contacts and you get a listing. Like it was undeniable. I started doing the math, like, holy shit, 20,000 contacts is 200 listings a year. Like I started doing that math, you know, like it was just, cause it just, you can't blame data. Like you can't deny data. And to me, that's like, Ooh, that's all I got to do. I got to just make phone calls and I get money. But, um, so I started making phone calls and we started getting listing appointments and who am I calling? Like, I get that hype. Like, yo, I just had an appointment. And, um, so me and Matt are going on the appointments together and, um, you know, we, Matt was nine years of experience. So now I have an agent who's got nine years of experience, five star Zillow reviews, and we're going on appointments together. So I'm setting appointments and rather than me being a brand new agent going in there and losing the listing, Matt, we're getting home sold because we have this guy who already knows what he's doing, nailing it down. So we kind of saw that as like, wow, this stuff's working. So, and at that time, he also had one ISA that he just had, um, who was like doing some cold calling for him too. And that kind of sparked the idea because I, I didn't know about ISA as much then. And that kind of sparked our future business plan. But um, so it ended up leading to us just continuing, you know, going on appointments together. And then ultimately, we came across two people called Chad and Michelle Wilson. And, um, you know, we were interviewing with them. And like, uh, I mean, I don't know if I want to take it there yet. Maybe I want to keep our dynamic first. But um, ultimately, we, we just kind of kept realizing that I needed to spend time on the phones and Matt needed to spend time going in the doors and us doing the same things is a waste of time. Mm. So we got really hyper focused. So I started just ripping phones, getting efficient, getting really good at them, you know, getting dialers, getting different lead sources. You know, I was big into, like, I was learning a lot about wholesaling. So I got into niche lists like absentee owners, downsizers, high equities, um, like things like that. And I started creating systems and processes around lead generation. And I, I love lead generation while Matt was going on every appointment, getting listing signed and handling every transaction. So I had to do nothing but system build lead generate. And Matt just went on appointments and got transactions done to the closing table. And that's when we like realized like, okay, this is, this is something that's working. We're on you know, to we're, something now. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I mean, we could dig further into that after, but, um, that's kind of, you know, that led to the whole operation we're running now. And I'd gladly go into the whole operation. You know, I'm like, it's, it's, I could, I'm not, I'm an open book because I just know to do what we're doing. They're not going to, you're do not it. willing to do it. They're not going to do it, baby. That's why, Hey, you know, sometimes I mean, I'll, I'll take an interview and I know it's somebody that's just coming in to check us out. I'll give them so much information and I know they're leaving and they're going, fuck, we ain't never doing that shit. <laughs> exactly. we ain't, there's nobody in this office that can coach us and train us like that guy. There's nobody that can do this, 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 and that. Nobody's going to be willing to confront everybody like this. Like that's, that's the beauty. When people try to keep it, Hey, if you want a part of this program, it's a, it's top secret, you know, dude, you could just give the game out there for free. It's accountability and, and real like um, determination from everybody involved. That's really going to make the difference. The, the, the information's out there. 
You know, like you guys could be doing it a different way without even being a part of, you know, EXP or Cooley and, and Michelle and, and all that kind of stuff. But there's power of having those players with you, right? And then they're all, have, they see the vision, they keep you accountable to that vision, they enhance that vision, right? And so that, that's what makes this business so great. You can get, you know, as soon as we talked about prospecting, half the people got off the podcast, you know what I mean? Because they're trying to find a way <laughs> um, how to get away from those things. Now, my question real quick is like, Matt, are, are you amiable personality? Can you explain the difference briefly? Yeah, so like there's four personality styles. Most people are okay. going to be majorly a part of one of these pillars. So you have analytical, amiable, okay. driver, mm -hmm. and expressive. When I hear Nick, I go, this guy's analytical, but he's also very expressive, right? And so he's very passionate about what he's doing. So he expresses himself kind of like, even to like me, I'm highly expressive. Cooley, highly expressive. You, you're more low key. Yeah. So you could be more amiable Absolutely. or you could even be um, even a driver, but I don't really feel that from you. What, what, do, you, what do you think you are? Do you, do you don't like confrontation at all? Is confrontation like, ah, like other than Nick confronting you about a system that needs to change, like are you big on confrontation or against it? I'm not against that at all. I think confrontation is always uh, room for growth. And uh, I think if you're an honest person and a competent person, you could handle confrontation no matter what it is, um, especially when you – go through daily consistent habits year after year of building that self-confidence. You know, you, you learn to accept confrontation and almost invite it as a way of continuing to level up. Yeah. Um, and by confrontation, it doesn't necessarily mean like a, like aggressive all in your face physical, which like, you know, very few people take it to that level. And in terms of just verbal confrontation and, you know, holding people accountable to certain things or trying to confront something about somebody. You know, if you're an honest person and know at the end of the day you're doing what has to get done and you're putting in the work necessary, there's nothing to worry about with confrontation. And so over time, you know, uh, just uh, the daily consistent habits, building that confidence, uh, I think personality has changed significantly. Um, I would say it's a pretty dynamic personality. I think I could handle almost any situation that comes my way. Yeah, and uh, feel pretty confident going into it. Yeah, I, when I look at both of you, I go, I mean, these guys are pretty versatile, right? And when I when I even bring up Amy, you know, somebody being amiable, expressive, driver analytical, I'm thinking about it from your dynamic because if like the, like your like the, your whole kind of swagger that you have, Matt, like you seem very calm, cool, collected kind of a guy that works very well in listing presentations, very well. Um, yeah. And you can run numbers a certain way, you can come across a certain way. Uh, I'm somebody that, you know, if I'm not, if I'm lacking versatility, I can come on way too strong to certain personality styles. And so over time, we all have to just keep on growing and building that versatility. I, I, I share this story every once in a while. There's a lady that used to work with uh, in my parents' brokerage growing up. And this lady, you know, around us, she's, you know, she was kind of super amiable. And, and uh, when she was with clients, she was like a hardcore driver under pressure. And so she was that lady that would take property time every second she could, right? And I would see her working with like 40, 50 people a year, but would only close like 12 deals a year because she would go show a property and go, if you don't buy one of these three properties, I'm not wasting my time on you. I'm out. And then they would go they'd call our brokerage and go, we need somebody different than this lady, right? Well, she lacked versatility and she never really got past 10, 12, 15 deals a year, but she had so many opportunities. And what I always realize is that when I see versatility in people, especially like you two, then you're able to not only run a business, but you can capitalize more on these conversations and on these presentations and, and really get some good uh, conversion rates that, that really are going to create a lot of profit, right? Um, and so now are you like, what percentage of the appointments, Matt, do you go on? Are you going on all of them or do you go on most of them? Is that kind of the deal right now? It's pretty much Nick is hitting the phones, filling my schedule and I'm going on whatever he schedules me. And sometimes we get so overbooked with appointments that Nick has to put the phone down for a little bit and hit appointments also, and either try to land a listing or get me in the door. So, you know, leads are abundant. You have to take advantage of it and if you just put in that daily work, just like Nick is doing, you can get good at it and get in, get into pretty much any door. And then in terms of my role, you know, it provides a huge uh, benefit to have experience. But if you have confidence, a good listing presentation, um, a good plan going in, you know, the, the sky's the limit to where you could take this. Yeah, that's strong. That's strong. And that's why uh, the other day I saw he, uh, Nick, you had a reel where you were like, you just left the presentation. And I was like, Okay, he does go on the presentations. I was like, okay, I see what's going on. But it's like, dude, if, if the pipeline's so busy and he's somewhere at five and you're like, I got something else at five and it's the only time, why not go get you one, right? 
And so what's good with that is like you can actually come in and go present and feel confident, um, Nick, as far as like even if most of the time you're making the calls, getting out there in person, that creates more versatility and the ability of like if he's on vacation one week, you got to go out there on those appointments. You know what I mean? If if he if he's on another appointment, you got to get out there. That's that's like super strong. What's like Nick, what's the like the, the daily regimen for you? Like what is your day? I want to ask Matt next. Nick, what what if somebody had to say, hey, Monday through Friday, sun up to sundown, what, what's Nick day what's Nick's day looking like? 720, me and Matt phone call. We uh we're talk, talking about all the appointments today, all the BS. 725, I got my video playing. I'm doing my breakfast club, my time, um, which I have all my ISAs. We have about five isas at this point um and uh, uh other agents are on there as well so i go through that role play eight o'clock hits dialed in till about 10 30 making calls um 10 30 comes i'm on the breakfast club take a little lunch break 11 uh, 30 any transaction stuff that i need to handle like co's uh sending out like stupid things like emails uh Photos, like just getting listings ready because like we also have assistant VAs, um, like admins rather not ISAs who I got to like oversee, make sure paperwork, all that stuff's going well. And then um, after that, I'm either on the phones, going on appointments, learning, or I'm building systems. And that's basically till whenever, you know, like if, if I'm not chilling with my girl till seven, eight o'clock at night, you know? <laughs> well, so I guess it's like, he's like, um, I'll just do the business, and it's really just all business, isn't it, Matt? He's just like, there's no personal. He's just going business right now, crazy. Are you that kind of guy <laughs> that, like, it's, you know, you actually have to, like, put the phone down and get away from things when you are, like, doing the, the private life stuff? Is it is it hard for you? to Like, are you fanatical about it? Because I know some it, of us, guys, we can get in the business, and it's like we don't want to stop because it is so much fun when it's going right, you know? Yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, it's honestly hard separating both. Um, I try so hard to be present when I'm, like, you know, with my loved ones, but right. I'm 23 years old right now. My girl gets it. You know, she's like, listen, I got to grind. Um, I got to set myself up for success. My mom's 60 years old. Um, she's still working 12 hour shifts, 40 hours a week, you know? And, um, you know, when I was growing up, there was times she was working six weeks straight, 12 hour days, no days off one hour break, you know, in a pizzeria on your feet, 12 Oof. hour days. So, so, you know, like, uh, that's what I'm, that's what I grew up looking at. You know, my mom, I saw my mom cry two times in my life. So, you know, like working at 23 years old on my ass, making phone calls and driving around is like the least of my worries. Dude, I love that. That answer is so good. We need to wrap that up in a, that, wrap that up in a reel for you for sure because it's just powerful. And, you know, dude, I didn't even realize you were 23. I just kind of thought like you and Matt were probably like my age. You know, 48. No, I'm, pretty, I'm 34. <laughs> Somebody the other day said I was like 44. I was like, you're an asshole. But, you know, I kind of thought that you guys were probably around 30. I'm guessing, you know, Matt, how old are you? I'm 31. You're 31. So we're closer in age. So, man, yeah. dude, like that, that makes that even makes like this discussion as far as like you guys working with each other. You know, <laughs> this is some young, young dude coming up to you at the pizza shop talking about some shit. Right. And you're like, all right, dude, let's let's see how much how bad this guy really wants it. And um, he talks like a guy who is not 23 years old, man. So that's, that's huge. That's huge. Now, Matt, what is your day-to-day? Because -day? that's a pretty powerful regimen uh, that you got going on, Nick, as far as, like, you know, going through that process on a daily basis. And I also would like to add in, I think it's cool that you're East Coast and you get to hop on that, that Pacific uh, – because we got – we, we do a pro agent BC breakfast club at 730 central. And then there's that 730 Pacific. So you can actually take kind of a quick break. You kind of run your own BC with your ISAs. You get in the trenches and start setting appointments and getting after it. And then mid morning, you're going back in there role playing, just sharpening it up even more. And you get to capitalize that because you're so many hours ahead on the East coast. Like I, I love that. That's great. It's like, I got a guy that's going to hop on. He's in Pacific time in El Paso. I just got a phone with him earlier. And I'm like, dude, you get to hop on at 6.30 on the Breakfast Club if you want to. So you get even that much better of a head start. But that mid-morning for you to be able to kind of like stop and jump, jump into that, I think it's cool, man. I think it's really cool. It, it's awesome, man. Chad, he gets me, you know, after my first block, he gets me ready to go for my second. Dude, and that's a big thing, man, because one of the things I'm always working with our agents is something happens around that 10.30, 11, 11.30, and agents, if you don't kind of uh, confront it, they'll just kind of waste that hour before 12 o'clock, that hour and a half before 12 o'clock. And you really do have to re-energize yourself. 
And if nobody's been a part of the Breakfast Club, you know, let me know. And if you're watching this, we'll get you access to it for a week. Dude, your heart, even like Nick, Nick, when I've heard you on there, you're so canned in your responses. And like, it, they sound so good. But even for you, I, I would imagine when Cooley's like, you know, getting you to step up to the plate, do you still feel that feeling of like, oh shit, I got to make it happen? Or how, how is it now for you? Now I'm like more collected. Like I'm waiting for opportunity. Like I'm looking forward to it. But for damn sure that first day I was scared as hell. <laughs> but like, uh, you know, it's, uh, I love it. Like I always done, I, I'm, I'm so quick to becoming a fool. Like I, I don't care looking weird. Like I know it's part of the process and the faster I can get through that, the quicker I could get to my end goal. And then like I put it in the work, you know, like I went back, watched every recording, you know, I wrote down notes. Like, you know, I just, it's simple. It's like, you just got to study. Yeah. Well, we got to be willing to be a foolish beginner before we can be a graceful master, you know, for sure, Matt, the regimen for you. Cause it seems like uh, you're the show pony out there and you have to like, if, if Nick is running these ISAs running himself and creating some opportunities, man, dude, like your presentation, all these things really have to be like, you know, to have all this front loaded effort, and then have somebody go out there, and now the responsibility on you is to have a super high conversion rate. What does that daily regimen look like for you to get all the success that you guys are having as far as getting the contract signed? Yeah, uh, so every morning, start out just like hydrating, getting the mind right, hitting the gym. I think a, a healthy mind brings a good energy into the day. Um, and then, uh, you know, we kind of get after it. By 9 a.m., I'm making phone calls to all of our current clients because I'm handling the transactions. It's important to communicate with these clients some of them on a regular basis. Uh, so it's really just the morning is spent with client care and then afternoon just ripping appointments, you know, driving all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Um, you go so from listing to listing to listing to listing appointment, right? Hours of driving every yeah. day. I set them up hours like, of like driving. 40 minutes apart. <laughs> Dude, the... Um... Hours of driving... Yeah, yeah the, dozens of phone calls. The the driving uh, and, and going from appointment to appointment. Do you do you feel like sometimes guys agents go on so few appointments that it's hard to build a hot streak? But for you, if you're going on two or three appointments, maybe even in a day, doesn't it kind of feel like it creates this flow of convert? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, like it keeps you hot. Yeah. And and it's at the point now where if we have a day where we don't have appointments. It's scary. Like, what's going on? That's not like us. We ha we have uh, we've set the bar high for ourselves on consistently hitting appointments every single day. But I would say the one common denominator me and Nick bring to the table is daily consistency. We put in the work and uh, have the habits that have created this daily consistent um, kind of like structure we have, and that is ultimately what produces the results. Having that daily consistency. Yeah, I agree. Now, Matt, one thing you talked about, and I think it's good for the viewers to, to hear, is like the communication with the clients. I tell our agents at the Pro Agent Group, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 25 years ago, there wasn't so much social media. There wasn't so much Internet. There wasn't so many things just draining people's attention spans, right? And yeah. maybe you could talk to your sellers once a week. Maybe you could talk to them every 10 days and it's like, you know, there's not so much getting at their attention. Now I kind of feel that people will forget about you. They'll even think that their service is not phenomenal. Your service is not phenomenal if you're talking to them so, uh, you know, rarely um, during the process. And so it seems like you probably would agree with me that these days you have to be communicating with these people to help them make educated decisions faster, get their property sold faster keep them updated with like this is what's going on with the property this is the feedback this is what the other competition that just came up in the marketplace where do we stand is like is that the value that you see like you have to talk to these people more based on like maybe what it would have been 10 years ago i think communication is incredibly important we have to remember at the end of the day this is a major decision for them to hire you as their listing agent um they are paying you for great service and ultimately you would want to give a service that you would want to get yourself so it's important to kind of like analyze each deal you're going through and see what needs attention and just let people know that you're there for them. You know, people want to be comfortable with your service and you're not going to have a recommendation based business unless you provide a great service. So 
Nick says it all the time too. It's important to sometimes break that friendship and client barrier and almost talk to them more like a friend, you know, be very honest with them um, and just kind of relate on things. So you can feel empathetic towards their situations, whatever they are going through, bring them excitement when there's good news, make them feel good throughout this process and ultimately make it feel like an experience for them. Yeah, because if you talk to them once a month and you're like, hey, Nick, we need to drop the price, they're just like, this guy's just trying to get a commission check for doing nothing, right? But when you spend that quality time, yeah. they will actually make the decision before you even mention it to drop price. Hey, what should we do with the price? That one just sold down the street. There's more hit in the market. Like, they're going to move better when they're more educated and you have that better bond, right? So um, I, I think that's really cool. You know, and, you know, whoever's watching this thinking, oh, well, I don't have a Nick, I don't have a Matt, I don't have maybe a small team of ISAs. Guys, you could do this in your own way by yourself. You just have to really schedule things a certain way. You have to create a certain type of regimen. And if you grow and you're profitable enough, then you can start going, who's that person in my marketplace that I can have this kind of relationship with that, old, that holds these kind of strengths? And you could look for those things, but you're not going to know what those things really look like until you have to get good at all those things. The thing for Matt, he's been doing it for so long, he's had to kind of play all these different positions. And now you have Nick, who's really good at that position. You're good at this position. You could trade positions if need be. If he's out of town, if he's too busy, if you're too busy, um, you guys can hold it down like that. But the fact that you can give each uh, position 100% is huge. And I wanted to wait for up to this point because you guys have dropped so much gold. What does this production look like now? Like, you know, how, how have things transformed uh, going from, let's say, February, right, 2023? Like, what did we close in 2023 and like, how many listings have we taken this year? What are we on track for? How are things growing so people can now get production, uh, you know, tied to this? Matt, I think I could take this one. Um, yeah. So in 2023, when we first started, you know, we were like two, like this is just me calling, having no skills before Chad and Michelle. We, we were still at like two to three listings a month. Um, and uh, then we started getting to five. Then we started getting seven. Then towards the end of the year, we were like nine, six, seven. Um, and we, we made the switch in July of last year, August. But I was working with Chad and Michelle for like, we were working with Chad and Michelle for like two months. Um, so then this year, um, we, we st nine, nine, eight, six. And right now we're at four, you know, like, um, so it's like, Last year, we took 64 listings. This year, so far, we're at 36. Um, and our conversion rate on those listings are a bit low. Um, we're at about like 44%, um, which is due to not setting the right expectations. And, um, you know, we were, we, we've got really good. And I always think about it this way is like, you know, we're obviously I'm business oriented, but we're still learning every day the real estate business and you know you go from learning to set an appointment or learning to make a phone call to learning to set an appointment to learning the presentation to getting into the closing table to like it's it's a long process and um you know we thank, thank god we have amazing coaches who were able to give our listing presentation to learn that we need to find more motivation and really just like be able to have them look at everyone else's business and see what their conversions are and see where we're at and be able to bridge the gap. And um, so we're really heavily focused on this year on really conversion because in every aspect from appointments to pre-qualifying the appointments to being more selective on the appointments to saying no to listings to um, knowing more about our clients to setting better expectations um, because you know, like last year, we probably went on 274 appointments, like actually went on. Wow. And, um, you know, we took 64 out of that. You know, I'm counting FISBO pre, I'm counting every type of appointment. You know, I'm not, I was never, I never started pre-qualifying appointments till two weeks ago. And <laughs> I, you guys are I know. wild. You guys are wild. You're like, what? You're able to ask these questions before we go out there? Huh, I think that's going to make a difference. Well, it's because that profit, been, that profit's in that 44 to 75%. Right. Like if we can go from yeah. being that 44 out of 100 to 75 out of 100, multiply that bad well, Chris, boy. When, when we linked up, we had uh, we had like a sole focus that we wanted to prove like we could take 100 listings in one year. And, uh, you know, from July to December, 62 from just now to May, 34. So we're at that 100 in, in under one year. We have proven that taking 100 listings 
very, very doable. But when you take those 100 listings, are they all good situations that are going to make it to the closing table? And that's kind of something you have to learn as you go. You know, we've proven that we can do this, but we see the conversion is low because of these listings that we're taking. We did not dig deep enough into their motivations and get to know their situation. So you kind of have to uh, shift the focus a little bit because we have proven one thing, taking listings. That's, uh, that's something we can do like that. Now it's taking great listings that will make it to the closing table. Yeah, standards going, hey, you know, what's the standard for the listing we want to take? And we're not, we're not the right guys for everybody, right? And, yeah. you know, the good thing, you guys are both so eager to grow and learn and, like, fail. Like, just let's just fail. Let's just fail. Let's fail um, forward, right? Most agents, and I've seen this, where, hey, I got six listings, but none of them are selling. The person stops prospecting. They stop the lead generating. They stop working on their skills. They go, I just want to go find a buyer who wants to buy right now. And they don't even get on the phone to do that. Instead of going like, what's, what's, like, why is it my fault? Like, if we keep on making it the client's fault, we never get to learn. But when we go like, what is something that I'm doing wrong? And I'm not pre-qualifying, which is a huge thing that we have to do. The next thing is like, hey, what's my real standard for a listing? You know, is there five key standards that I have and they have to meet this metric? And the only way I'm going to slide on it and, and go forward with it is like if this one, the motivation is so strong or like, but there, if there's no, if there's no real standards there, then you guys could pay for a lot of photos, a lot of videos, spend a lot of time with the wrong people um, because the time is even the most important thing. You got Matt driving an hour to go to somebody's house. He spends an hour there, an hour leaving there to go somewhere else. And then if he takes two listings that day, but they don't sell, dude, I just lost six hours. Then we spent $1,000 or more on photos and video. Then I'm doing all this bullshit. And I could have been on the phone finding better people. I could have been at a different presentation. And then that starts what's creating more separation mm -hmm. as far as failing to success, right? Yeah. And, and so our standard, you know, was three appointments a day. And it wasn't, it wasn't qualified appointments a day, you know? And um, the, the big shifts that we've really, like one thing that really flipped in my mind was understanding that sellers, whatever you tell them, they're going to think, you know? So like setting expectations is so important because if we tell them at the listing presentation, we're going to get you this many offers by this time, that's all they're going to remember. Oh yeah. But meanwhile, we've made such a shift to not talk about like any expectations of what's going to happen, but just talk about what we're going to do because ultimately we can't control the outcome we can only control the expectations. And a big shift we also made is we allow this, we give this, we educate the sellers on price and then we give them an options and kind of guide them, but limit the expectations on each price and kind of make them make the decision. And rather than telling them it's going to happen fast, we kind of just kind of are now under giving bad, lower expectations and over delivering. Yeah. And, um, it's been such a big shift because we've been gaining so because if you don't know the true motivation of a client and you're taking a listing, it's like when you go to talk about accepting an offer, when you go to a price drop, you know, like you can't leverage their motivation. You can't put them in that emotional state where they're thinking about envisioning themselves and their motivation. Like, is it worth being with your grandkids in North Carolina or is Ted Grand more important? You know, like and uh, if they're not thinking about being with their grandkids, they're thinking about 10 grand that they're losing. Yeah. And um, so we've made some major shifts, you know, exactly. And we've made some major shifts and uh, we've completely changed our mindset. And we're really excited because we honestly don't even need to take more listings. You know, we just need to convert better, even though we're working on taking more listings. And another part of it, too, is is we're trying to build foundation and like we're taking not, we we're starting taking seven to ten listings a month like that. And to go from taking two to seven to nine and keeping on top of the paperwork, keeping all the clients up to date, um, getting all the listings on the market, photos, going on appointments, keeping production, like it, it's like you're you're kind of, you know, you go, that's why, a re, that's a big reason why our conversion was low. And now we have the systems in place. We have the scripts in place. We have the structure in place to be able to handle this business and get it to the closing table. Yeah, well, that's where... You know, that point, even though there's like success going on, it's where things can either break down or you break through. 
right? And then so you keep molding and keep figuring that out, right? Now, when it comes to, you know, meeting with sellers, and and buyers like are you guys doing buyer deals at all are you referring the buyer deals out like how does that part of the process work for you guys yeah we're, we're referring the buyer deals out at the moment you know we're kind of like uh in the stage where we can take on a buyer's agent but it takes a certain type of person to fit the culture sometimes and you have to be willing to uh accept when there's not a good fit so we're willing to be patient with it but right now we're such a listing based focus do we work with buyers occasionally? We do, absolutely. But we're not typically, you know, going on showings on a daily basis. We're delegating that out to other agents. Smart. Um, I mean, we're yeah. in such the beginning process of like what we're building. It's like not even like one percent. We're doing one percent of what our goal of what our goal is, you know, like it's like uh it that's kind of where we're at, you know. We're just we're thinking huge, we have a huge map, a huge vision. And we're just like in the littlest bit of beginner stages. Yeah, focus on the quality though too because so many people go, well, I can't pass up on the buyer business. It takes a certain amount of like wisdom and character to go, you know what, we may need to refer some of these buyers out so we can keep working on our process for the listings and sacrifice. And that sacrifice could really work out. And, you know, we're talking about 30, 36 or so listings taken pretty much in the first quarter and month. You know, you got pretty much five months in, right? You know, the na now you're in um, in May. And so, yeah, it's over 100 deals that are going to take place. And then you think, okay, well, a year ago, we're doing two, three, uh, we're taking two, three a month. Now we're on track to go ahead and do 100 listings or more in one year. 2025, 2026, 2027, it's kind of crazy. Like, even a 20% even a increase is nuts, you know? Like, that's unfathomable for most people. Um, is there a goal in mind of like how many you want to have closed by the end of this year? Or is it mostly like we just need to at least take X amount of listings? Like what's the main focus? Like how many listings we take or how many deals we want to have closed? So this is where I measure success based off of like uh, activities and not results, you know? So like when I look at success, yes, I think it's important that we bridge the gap. We get our conversion up, but bridging the gap and getting your conversion up up is not bridging the gap and getting your conversion up it's building systems and structure to get there so like i measure success like are we taking the right steps to get to where we need to go are we breaking down strip scripts like now when we take a listing we have a full-on script of digging super deep the next day because we could decide the next day if we still want it or not and we find out everything we need to know so that's a, a system you know it's it's matt and i are not GT Luxury Group. We're just pieces that plug into GT Luxury Group. And our goal is to build GT Luxury Group to something where we can unplug us, plug somebody else in, and us move to a different position until we do it again. And, um, you know, so for me personally, like my goal, and me and Matt have two different kind of, we have goals for our group together, but like he has his side of the business and I have my side of the business. My goal is creating a system and a business to where I don't need to, because like right now with me and Matt, Matt going on appointments and me making phone calls, that's time. Yeah. My goal is get to the, get the business to the point where it's just money. I just need to leverage money. I know if I have four ISAs, three of them are outbound lead gen. One of them's an internal ISA work in the database and I have one listing agent, they can handle this many appointments, take this many listings, and this is my ROI. If I know that, all I have to do is just, just keep cranking that system out. You know, so that's kind of like where my head's at in terms of goals. Doing deals and, and making money is just for me to be able to reinvest into that. Mm. That makes sense. That makes sense. No, Matt, when you hear that question that I asked, is there a number that comes up for you? Or do you think very much like you clearly adopt that mindset as well of like, hey, if we're taking massive action, we're making the proper changes on our systems, then clearly we're going to just keep growing and doing what we're doing. Is there do you do you think keeping a number in mind is good for you? Do you have one? What, what does that look like? I, I don't keep a mon uh, number in mind. I see uh, I see it as as long as there's just continued growth. And it's always that growth mindset. I think that's the most exciting thing to look forward to. Um, the ultimate goal is just to like enjoy this, you know, uh, build a business with a great partner 
uh, develop these systems, learn entrepreneurship and building a business along the way, keep it exciting and just kind of enjoying the journey. So there's no really uh, like num numerical goal, but the ultimate goal is to build a, a great well-oiled machine that exactly what Nick said, we can kind of like uh, plug out and plug in and ultimately uh, have the freedom to live the life we want to live. Well, Tom Brady said it straight. He never set out to win seven Super Bowls. He just set out to be the best he could be every single day, every single rep, you know? Oh, yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. Well, one of the, th the thing that strikes me is, like, when you know you're building a business to replace yourself, because in essence, that's what we're doing, right? We're building something to where we can put... We can literally give somebody a high-paying occupation by coming and being a part of the GT Luxury Group, right? Then you go, well, I need to learn how to do this so that there's no way that I can't coach and train somebody to play this role, that role, or that role. And so then you kind of take yourself out of it in a sense where it's like, if I try to be this guy that are these guys that try to like start some team and, and add things, uh, you know, inappropriately and that doesn't really make any sense, these people that get a they're going to get better at the things that you never got great at. And then why are they going to need you, right? And I think that's the problem for, for a lot of agents. They go, I want to be a good individual agent. Maybe I want to run some kind of a team. But they try to move too fast in a sense where they want people to work for them and do all the hard work too early on because they're just not willing to put in that sweat equity. And you guys are like, we're forward thinking so much, maybe not in terms of units, but in, in this like lifestyle and what we want this business to ultimately look like. And then, you know, we just got to get after it and take a lot of action and get there sooner than later. I know we're going to wrap up here in the next two minutes, three minutes. we got a hard exit. If, if you two, and, and, you know, Nick, if you want to run this one first, if somebody's in the business, whether they're brand new, whether they're a year in the business, five years in the business, whatever the case is, and, and things are not running the way they would like them, what do you think is like probably hindering the success of like 80, 90 percent of the agents in the business and What's some advice that, you know, at least you feel, and we'll hear from Matt next, like what's some advice that they could write down and implement? So there's, I got a couple things here and this almost happened to me, but I'm resourceful and not everybody's resourceful. Um, it's a business. You go to Chipotle, you go to Walmart, you go anywhere else. They're open at this time. They close at this time. You can't start the day at a different time every single day. You're open at this time. You close at this time. Number two is you don't know what you don't know. Like everything's already been done. Somebody's a beast at prospect and somebody's a beast at Instagram. Somebody's a beast at everything's been done. Don't reinvent the wheel. Get a mentor. If you can't afford a mentor, reach out to Chad and Michelle. But, um, and then finally um, is if you're a new agent, understand one thing. When you're thinking about commission splits and joining a team, it's not like the team's making massive wealth off of you. It's just they're paying a lot of money to provide a lot of support so that you could focus on your job. And in return, they're taking a piece off the top. So I have systems in place to where I can focus on what I need to focus on, but it costs me money. You're better off being on a team that can provide all of that to you so you could just freaking get a database full of leads to just work. That's my advice. Smart, smart. And well, you know, most agents, Nick, are not thinking in terms of actual profitability, thinking about net. They're thinking about split way too often. And, you know, I interview agents and talk to agents and they got like no deals going on, but their splits 100 percent and they got to pay for all those things. <laughs> but they don't pay for things because they have no money. And then somebody may be on a 50 50 split somewhere making 250 a year. Um, and so it's like, you know, everybody wants to also be the A player. You could be a higher paid B player meaning like position wise in a company, you could, you could be, there's people that are a broker owner of a company, but have a lot of agents underneath that brokerage that make way more money than that broker does. Right. So it's like, you know, we, our egos get in the way, Matt, what would be your answer? Um, you know, as some things that are tangible that you've seen, cause you have nine years of experience, right? And if somebody was to say, Hey, yeah. this is what I need to write down and apply to my lifestyle for real estate immediately. What would those things look like? I think obviously daily consistent habits, are a major foundation of any successful person's life, showing up every day despite how you feel. Even if you don't sleep great or you're not feeling so good, it's about what you do on the days where you don't feel like that. What are you doing? And that's what really separates you from the average person. 
Um, but also I would say uh, something, just a, a piece of advice for, I guess this would apply to anybody, you know, Nick, uh, he was working at a pizza place, 23 year old kid, um, multiple years in the business, high producing agent. And this guy just comes into my life and, you know, kind of get this glimpse of uh, different kinds of value that they bring to the table. And I, I've come to, you know, kind of see in life that the universe will sometimes prevent or uh, present you opportunities. And it's important to keep an eye out when you recognize a glimpse of one of these opportunities and not let it slip by. And when Nick came into my life, uh, you got to kind of just take ego out of it sometimes and just see what people bring to the table, regardless of age or regardless of their situation. Listen to what can people have to say, because, you know, we don't know it all. And if you could find somebody that complements what you don't have, there's a lot of ways to make money off of that and profit off of that. So I think it's important to just stay open minded and uh, recognize that, you know, sometimes opportunities may present themselves. And uh, if you recognize something like that, jump on top of it. Don't let it some slip by. Too many people are, like to play it safe and seek comfort, but uh, that's just going to lead to kind of like an average life. If you crave that above average lifestyle and want better for your life and want to be that unique individual, I think it's important to just be open-minded to the world and uh, kind of see what opportunities everything presents in itself. Man, that, that was powerful. It, it makes me think of a conversation I had with a guy uh, yesterday at the gym, everything he said was negative. And he's like, oh, I spent 25000 and all this equipment that I have at my house. And, you know, there's all these reasons why there's too much competition for doing this, too much competition for that. And I'm like, dude, you have so much opportunity. Who else has $25,000 in those, in those mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like nobody does. Well, you know, <laughs> you, talk, you talk like you don't have opportunity. The opportunity is in front of you right now. Are you not like the guy wants to cut trees down? That was his whole vision. Dude, you hit, if you don't have money to have a sales guy, are you knocking on the doors? Go to the old neighborhoods. There's trees. You see, you know what kind of tree needs to be taken down. You have all the equipment. Pull up with equipment. Go to door to door to door. Dude, there's more money to make on one street than you could even do, right? But the problem is, is that most people, Matt, don't even see the opportunity when it's, when it's right in front of them. And so it looks like yeah. you did. It looks like you executed on that. Nick's been executing on that. And guys, this is probably one of the best uh, interviews and podcasts I've ever done. And what I want to do is, um, number one, thank you both for being on here with me because it's, it's been awesome. Um, number two, I would love to do something near the end of the year to see what's really came about, you know, uh, down the road six months and what everything's looking like, what things, ha what things have changed, um, how that conversion rate, how things got better. And I think a lot of people will be excited to watch that. So hopefully you guys will, um, you know, give me some time here, maybe six months down the road. Okay. For sure, man. I yeah, appreciate we'd you, love Chris. that. Looking forward to uh, seeing you on stage in uh, June 5th or whatever in Seattle. Yeah. Are you going to be on stage too? Yes, sir. Okay. Hope we don't screw it up too bad, huh? No, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm excited, man. I've been envisioning it. I've been planning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Well, you know, you, talk, you mentioned Greg Harrelson earlier, which is one of the goats. And first time I ever met Greg Harrelson, I was like, Greg, I'm going to be the better version of you. I, was, I, was, I had a couple cocktails and I walked up on him in Miami and I was like, I'm going to kick your ass. You'll see, you'll see me. And then um, we ended up becoming pretty cool after that. And like, I was like, the next day I was like, man, I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of came at you a certain way, but it's really just because <laughs> dude, I, 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 I love everything you put out there and it's gold. And then now we get to go on stage with Greg and have him speak. It's like, whoo, we, be we better, we better crush it, baby. We better <laughs> crush it if Greg's doing it. So Yo, man, I, th thank I, you both. For I would have never imagined, honestly, just cause like, that's like one of those manifesto moments in my yeah. life where, I've been, I've watched every level up podcast, every single one. And most of them twice, you know, like I joined real, real, uh, whatever real estate success Academy. Like, and then Michelle and Chad came in our life and like, I interviewed Michelle and I was like, century 21, you know, Greg Harrelson. She's like, yeah, I've camped with him. Like I've climbed mountains with him. Like I love Greg. And then now I'm on a stage with this guy and I'm going to meet him finally. He, you know, how I am, but <laughs> he will, man, baby. G. He will, he will. And he is a G um again thank you guys and i know um you guys got a lot of business to get to uh today and this weekend so uh kudos and thank you for the time